What we're showing today is uh, is a continuation of what we've shown you in, at, uh, in February. There was a demo that ended with uh, with a cinematic where you found out that uh, the rebels had uh, hijacked some of the weaponry that was used for the knights, and we cut the cut that gameplay moment actually right there. And what you see here is the continuation of it, where you're in Whitechapel, you're trying to find out what's going on, you're trying to make your way to actually the the, the London Hospital, which is in Whitechapel. And, uh, and we pick up where the four knights, you, were, you only had Lafayette before, but here you're teaming up back with uh, the other two knights, uh, Percival and Igraine, to fight the rebels. Let's go. One of the weapons we've talked about in the past, in the trailer back in, uh, at E3 2013, was the, the thermite rifle. Uh, Lafayette used it in that, and it was really a glimpse to get people to start talking about it. This is our first chance to really demo what it can do, and uh, what that weapon does is that it has two modes of fire. One mode of fire, which is uh, uh, that it shoots a cloud of uh, aluminum, aluminum iron oxide that, uh, that can basically be detonated or set on fire with a flare. The alt fire is that flare. What's cool about that weapon is that you really can paint fire into the into into the world, if you, if you in so many words. But what it does is that it's it's a it's a cover buster. If there's somebody behind cover, you can spray um, the aluminum iron oxide above cover, ignite it, and the the molten basically metal will rain down on whoever's behind cover and literally set them on fire. So it's really a kind of a cool gameplay mechanic to actually get them to do that and uh, and and progress. When we started talking about Blackwater, we really, uh, you know, kind of set the uh, the stage for why the knights were who they were, uh, how long they've lived, the fact that they've lived long and regenerated from their wounds in battle, and uh, what that Blackwater is is really like both a blessing and a curse, you know, as far as the lives of the knights are concerned. You know, they live longer, but they also see everyone else around die, so it's a very lonely, cursed life. One of the side effects of it is that for the hundreds of years they've taken it, black water has, has, has a permanent presence in their body almost. And what it's given, one of the side effects of it is what we call black sight. And black sight is a, a mode where, as a knight, you, your skills are, are so honed that in that moment you get to uh, experience the world in almost a slowdown, you know, uh, time, like a slowdown of time, and you can shoot enemies faster than they can react. And, uh, and really give you, again, a different mode of gameplay into the core combat. Blackwater is something that, uh, that not only can, uh, do we have for, for, for game purposes as, as far as uh, you know, uh, what you've seen in the demo, uh, what we've shown in the, in the story as well, but also something that the player will carry and uh, they will be able to actually use it in the game at different points in the game to you know, get away from dangerous situations. Let's move them. They're bringing reinforcements! We're sitting ducks out here! The way we've, uh, we've slightly changed the way we approach our cover system, especially with the introduction of what we call soft cover, is that uh, we didn't want players to be just attached to cover purely because it was a toggle on off mode. What's great about uh, our cover is that not only do you, you, can you attach to it, but you can also detach to it seamlessly. I mean, really kind of roam around in this soft cover mode where you're a little more hunkered down, you have a small, uh, smaller target, you know, and you become a smaller target to the enemy, and you can kind of roam around and automatically seamlessly come into cover again. Uh, the way we're changing you know, players from just hunkering down is that there are going to be some enemies that you're not going to be just able to be behind cover to do any, like you know, do, do certain things. You'll have to get out of cover, you'll have to use different modes, just like Black Side that we introduced. You will have to basically get into those modes to progress in the game, and you'll see that between uh, not only the, the, the core combat, the core range combat that we've shown, but also between the melee combat that we have, you'll see that there is a lot of uh, you know, diversity in the way you're going to live that moment to moment again. When we built London, when we built Whitechapel, uh, there were a lot of things that we wanted to, uh, to infuse into our world. They were not only part of real lore, but also some, some, sometimes part of the mystique of what London was. Uh, what, uh, for example, there, there are certain iconographies, you know, in, this, in the world that you'll find in the walls of London, for example, that have, uh, that have more meaning than what you think. Uh, actually, the, the Rook and the Raven, for example, that's, uh, that's uh, graffitied on, on one of the walls, has not only something to do with something we created, but uh, to keep the mystery alive, it also is based in a reality that actually exists in London. And I really would love to see how players are going to connect with that, and maybe your viewers also are going to connect with that. But actually, it has a root in something that is a, a law of, of today's London.
Since we started working on, uh, on, on this project, there was one, there's one answer, unanswered question that is still, you know, that's still out there, and it's purposefully uh, out there because we want people to, to, to really, we want to give the best possible exposition to that uh, unknown, and that's the half breed. Uh, the half breeds are, are, we've introduced them, you know, in, uh, you know, in the past, and told a little bit about their backstory, about how they are the, the evolution of uh, humanity. Uh, what we haven't done yet is actually really tell you exactly who they are and, and in the near future hopefully we'll be able to basically give you more about them. Mon Dieu. Approaching London in the way that we did, we wanted to actually hold true to the London that not only we know today, which is a little bit more of a dreary London, I mean it, it, it rains all the, often, let's say, uh, but at the same time we wanted to depict a London that we forget in so many ways because it's evolved so much. Um, you know, it's, and, and it's that idea of the Dickensian London. If you were to read, read a, a Dickens novel, you don't even have to have the pictures. It's, it's amazing how, how when you read it, you can illustrate the whole world that is depicting in your head. And it's kind of that Dickensian London that we wanted to basically show here. Um, that world is dirty. That world is, you know, rough. And uh, it's, it's that reality that we wanted to rebuild in uh, the order 1886. On the first floor! You know, of course, building London also means building every part of London. Um, it's, uh, it's building the, the streets, the elevation, playing with the elevation, trying to see basically how we can maximize that for gameplay purposes. And of course, there are also places in London that do exist underground that we'll be able to uh, you know, go into and, and, uh, and explore, and that are part actually of the continuity and this narrative of the, of the game. When designing this game, there are multiple questions that came up. I mean, whether it was multiplayer co-op, very early on, I mean, we're at the very genesis of the, uh, the, the design of the game. We discussed every single mode we could do, what we dreamt of for this game. The reality of it is that to make each of those games takes a team. To make a great single player game, you can sacrifice that for multiplayer. And same thing goes from multiplayer to co-op. We discussed co-op in the past, but it was never something that we truly wanted for this game because there was only one way to expose the world to this IP and that was through a single player game. Working on it. How bad is it? A punctured lung, I think. Another bullet through the stomach. Regardless of what people have and the, the preconceived notion sometimes that you have about how something is going to feel, what we're trying to do is try to break certain grounds. I mean, even with what we showed at, in February with uh, those, uh, you know, those, uh, those branching uh, events uh, where you're able to do multiple things to uh, uh, kill an enemy, uh, the interesting thing was to give them something that wasn't as jarring as what they've expected in the past. I think that people expect things like cinematics to just completely take you out of the game. They expect things like different modes of gameplay to literally you know, stop what you were expecting to play and take you somewhere completely different and then suddenly feel like, wow, that was two different games. What we're trying to solve here, and I think that we, we are, we're getting to the point where we know that it's something that, that was a risk but that we're achieving, is not detaching them from that gameplay. So we are infusing those moment to moment without totally detaching them and making them hate those moments. I think that they will hopefully love those moments because of what they are, because they are part of the continuity of the gameplay. Stop for a pint, did you? Building a, an alternate reality is, uh, is, uh, is, is, is tricky because you want to infuse as much reality as into it as possible with the fiction that you're creating. Uh, but reality also means infusing real people. There are certain famous figures that, are, that you're going to find in the game. There's one in particular that I'm thinking we're going to talk about very soon uh, that, uh, that is a part of the IP. And there are other people that actually are going to come in and out of the IP that are in, an integral part of the story but also ancillary part of the story uh, as well. What did you find? They saw their first field action a few weeks ago. One of the favorite parts of, of, this, of, of, of the game for me has been really the blend of uh, narrative that we've been able to achieve with this. Uh, we've, uh, we've worked closely not only within the team but even with people outside like Kirk Ellis, you know, who's a scriptwriter uh, uh, who's worked on John Adams for HBO, uh, to bring uh, certain flavors that you know, we thought were missing in, in games, uh, whether it was in the language that we use, whether it's in the moment-to-moment -moment gameplay. One thing that I'm most proud of is that all of these, and it's different people's minds actually really melding for this kind of stuff, uh, we have 125 people working on this project and really this is the result of a lot of ideas coming together, weeding out a lot of them and trying to get the best
best out of everything that we had. And what you'll see here is that uh, is uh, is gameplay-wise, I think we are achieving something that is a lot of fun. But especially visually, we're, we we've gone to a point where I think that there is a lot of fidelity that we're achieving here uh, in the performances from characters that uh, that is that that you haven't seen necessarily in games before. And that I'm hoping that we're going to do a lot more of, and that we're going to show the, the players in the future. This one hasn't been assigned yet. What we've shown today is, uh, is a part of Whitechapel, the level of Whitechapel that uh, is a continuity of what the gameplay was in, uh, in what we've shown in February. But you can expect to see more ID3 uh, new things actually for the, for the players to experience. Do you see our comrades? Not yet. There. It must be them.